um, firstly, thank you very much for, for interviewing me on the subject. Um, I have waited several years because um, the, I'm still part or part of the investigation that continues in France. And um, in view of that, in early ap April, I had then decided to send the uh, French judges, uh, who I've been cooperating with, by the way, over the years, um, a deposition of about 274 pages, which I had notarized at the French Embassy and sent to the, um, to the judges of the Grand Tribunal. I now feel that I'm having done so, that I'm in a position to, uh, to uh, probably come out to shed some light on, on, on what really happened. Um, it's also been rather difficult for me because I've been disparaged on both sides. Uh, it's been, you know, all these years, it's been detrimental to my health. Um, the government must have been concerned as to why I remain silent. And um, the other side was saying that I had um, not been cooperating with the French. So I thought I'd put the record straight. Um, having uh, you know, submitted my deposition uh, to the French authorities so that no one can actually say that I'm not cooperating and neither can someone say that I'm a silent or maintaining a dignified silence. And you've been cooperating with the uh, French investigation since? Um, the first phone call I received from uh, the French police, uh, Madame Anne-Sophie Coulbois, was in February 2011. And uh, since then, I have been communicating with them, and um, I received um, a, a written, well, subpoena, I it, or a request by the French authorities, um, which was sent to me in September, but actually arrived in October uh, 2012. Do you? Uh Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the defense uh, industry. Yes. Um, my background in the defense industry goes back quite a long way. Um, I was involved in the defense industry in the 1970s in England. Um, I had worked for um, a, um, a, a Middle Eastern based um, company um, which had uh, a strong tradition in, in, in defense work. And uh, that's where I received my training at quite an, quite a, an early age. Um, later on, um, returning to Malaysia, I'm also in the oil and gas industry. Um, I am, became involved in the industry uh, through then Thompson CSF, which was really, um, now of course it's called Thales. I worked very closely with the French from about 1997, I think it was, when we started working on the OPV. Um, we were working on also looking at a, a Franco-Saudi situation whereby we would look at um, some of the um, aircraft um, in uh, maintenance in, in Malaysia, looking at working on some sort of joint venture with M Malaysia. Um, and then we were also submitted later uh, to um, our government um, the short-range air defense um, missile, it's called Krotal, it was there from Thales. And whilst we were working uh, together with the with Thales, the French, uh, predominantly uh, Martin Hill, who was the managing director, and uh, Monsieur Elan Letanu, who was his uh, director um, for defense business in Asia. So we were pursuing a number of projects, and at that time, um, the French said that uh, they had not been successful. Um, this was around the mid 90s? Late 90s, yeah, late 90s, 97. We were now moving on to 98, 99. And uh, the French um, said that they had not, or Thales had not achieved any great success in Malaysia and had been here for almost more than 10 years. Um, and could we, could I work with them um, on a specific project 
um, which was really the, something that M Malaysia had been looking at, our country had been looking at for about 12 years, uh, the submarines, a submarine um, acquisition. So the, the uh, intention to acquire a submarine was already in the cards well before you got involved in the, in the project? Oh, definitely, certainly, yeah. it, it, was, it was well in the cards and uh, several submissions had been made. Uh, even the French had made a previous submission, a um, more technical submission, but um, um, you know there was uh, there was no sort of urgency as such till uh, till Martin brought this up and said, "Could we, you know, pursue this with uh, some vigor?" Which we did. In that, could you? Uh Give us a timeline of how and when the project started, specifically the Scorpion. Yeah, the actual project, uh, I mean, uh, the pursuit of uh, the, 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 the submarine project um, actually began for us in about 1998, 1999. Um, and that began with a whole load of, you know, um, there was a prodigious amount of research um, because there were competitors. The, 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 um, the Germans, the Turco-German submission had been made. Um, the, the Dutch were also in pursuit of this project and with uh, very fervently, um, aggressively. Um, then there were the Koreans, of course, who were in the game. The Swedish had, to a certain extent, marginalized themselves by simply by the fact that they had sold submarines to a neighboring country. Um, so we did have to evaluate, conceptualize, do the competitive uh, evaluation strategies. Um, of what was the best submarine available at that time, whether we were better, whether the Scorpion was going to be the ultimate um, product that we should um, acquire or, or, or promote uh, for acquisition to our country. I mean, one is you know, working with the French was one thing, but being a Malaysian nationalist was another. So one had to, one had to, I mean, you know, um, one had, uh, king and country came first. Um, profit was a secondary matter because I mean every project I mean you know is an entrepreneur. Uh, that's why we are called the defense industry, and it's an industry. Um, but one has to make sure that there's some, uh, you know, um, compatibility between one's um, uh, personal um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, needs uh and ambition uh with um uh, foremost in one's mind of course was uh, was it good for king and country the role of uh Permica and Trasasi, could you elaborate on that who did the the, uh, the initial research work prior to the deal being signed and who was responsible for the training and support uh, Right. The we um, the actual trigger the in the um, the embryonic stage and the development was all done by basically my, my own team at that stage with with the French, starting with the French, and then we we then brought in um, some other partners um, as a uh, sort of uh, 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 Mohammed Ibrahim Noor, uh, who was a, a friend, um, brought him in and uh, then we, we teamed up and we needed uh, a defense analyst who was um, uh, you know, an educated man, erudite in the art of um, on def well, basically defense analysis. We've been lecturing on defense, and had some understand of, and understanding of regional dynamics uh, to come into the game. And so that was then it was Razak um, Abdullah, uh, Razak uh, Bakindes, he calls himself, 
uh, so he and then we we teamed up um, uh, together and uh, by then of course my team had established quite quite a lot of um, the the groundwork um, um, to ensure that uh, we would get this project or get this submission done and through at its first pass because there was obviously no second chance I mean, either you know, do it well, hit the ground running, or, or that was the end of the game. Perry Mackerel was one which was more for um, the execution, the position, what, what was the combination of a defence deal, the very dynamics of a deal are quite, to a certain extent, quite complex. Um, the, you need a, um, a number of uh, key um, uh, areas or ingredients in, this, in the matrix. Um, the Malaysian industrial participation, um, counter trade, um, all of this, um, uh, financing options, all of that was done prior to the actual submission. The, execution of the MIP and the um, training, the project management, project integration, um, liaison with the, um, the client looking after the 145 volt personnel that were in Brest and some in Cartagena in, in Spain, um, liaising with the government, producing reports on the status. Um, the accommodation, um, you know, it, it principally involved um, the uh, uh, sort of almost the the complete package uh, prior to um, the, the services the uh, services that were required prior to the actual um, arrival of the submarine to our shores. So it was a quite a, a, an effort that lasted over a period of a number of years. So it took quite an effort, but close to five to six years. And this was handled by Trusses? By Perimeka. Perimeka. Yeah, Perimeka was the, the project manager providing um, the um, so called contract services. What about Teresasi's role in this? Teresasi's role was a little bit different because Teresasi was the, we were at that time, uh, was the initiator. Um, Teresasi would, I would compare it more to the role of a, almost as if one was an investment banker really, if one were looking at it. One had to do um, the strategic planning for the actual uh, submission. Uh, learn all about the economics and the dynamic, dynamics of all the parties involved um, to ensure that there was no derailment of, of this project that included again back to um, financing packages, uh, counter trade, um, competitive uh, and understanding of the uh, strengths of the competitors, um, future submarines, what was coming on stream and um, uh, in-depth uh, on uh, understanding of, of uh, uh, even regional dynamics. Um, so it was, uh, it was a very uh, pragmatic uh, sort of role. Um, it needed um, a lot of um, uh, strategizing to, as I said, to um, we even looked at uh, various financing options how we could help the government. We had Saffron Tem, we worked with Paribas. Um, on the counter trade, we submitted uh, documents to uh, uh, for Proton. I wanted uh, uh, a, a deal on lending rights, also from Malaysian Airlines in Paris. Uh, counter trade with not only France, but also with, with Spain, because it was a joint venture um, in technology between Spain and France. So um, it was, um, you know, a lot of, uh, I would say, a um, lot of uh, strategic uh, and uh, more strategic trusted advisory type of role. As I would put it, you know, in line with, say, um, you know, we could, uh, we 
could align it to any other industry, it will probably uh, um, uh, someone like um, a, a private equity company working on a, another industry. So we were you know, working on something similar here, but the difference is that um, we were Malaysians working on a Malaysian project with the passion of a Malaysian. And I think that's what carried us through. It's most unfortunate, really, that the word commissions used here. Um, as I said earlier, um, one, the perimaker part was contract services, which, like any project manager, would provide to any other project. I do not see a dissimilarity between that and someone being a project management for a dam um, or um, a real project. Um, the Terrasasi part, as again, can, if I may go back to what I said earlier, Rivet, um, the, the amount of work that went into the development of this project, I mean, why had nobody won this over 12 years? The amount of um, uh, strategic thinking, the, the, the um, uh, technical evaluation, the um, um, comparative, you could compare it to, uh, as I said again, uh, uh, if a private equity firm would have done this job, what would they have charged? The difference would have been that the private equity firm would not have been made up of probably Malaysians who would have had no passion and probably would have you know, charged maybe two, three, four percent, I'm, I'm uncertain what they would have charged. That would have been fees. Now, and that as it would be in any other industry. So here, the one was the service provider which is the, what we call an external service provider, which is not uncommon in the defense industry to have the, a Malaysian partner or a, national, a local um, company working closely with the foreign party to ensure that you know, everything is submitted and has the right sort of culture, the right sort of approach, and has, as I said, very importantly, the, 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 the nationalism and passion of the, of the Malaysian partners must really be reflected in the document. So if I were to ask you what these services entail, what would, what would you say uh, in terms of the service management fees? What, what did they, what did they Sorry, there are two different things. I mean, one is the, the project management by, by Perry Mika, okay. which was like on, on through life exec, of the execution of the project. And the Terrasasi part was the work done prior to it to ensure that the submission itself would have technical, commercial, all of that counter trade, the offset program, um, what I mentioned yes. earlier. The special programs of local companies. Yes, and um, the Malaysian industrial participation. All of that had to be, be thought out um, the investigation of um, um, our other submarines' capability, um, competitive position. Um, well, you know, as I said, um, of course, there was no question of uh, uh, it was at that time. Um, we, uh, my feeling was that uh, uh, at that time and at that price, that the Scorpion was the best possible submarine that my country or for, I mean, would, could ever have chosen. Premaker's fees was quoted uh, at around 450 million ringgit. Yes. Uh, that seems a bit high. Could you explain why that is? Um, 450 million was actually the gross revenue that was paid to Perimaker. And it was, if you look at the total project value, it, the, it was in the region of uh, based on the correct sort of euro conversion, was in the region of about 4.5 billion ringgit, depending on your, your conversion. Um, and now, 450 million is close to about 10 percent. Now, 10 percent is um, a, a more or less an acceptable fee for project management in most industries. Now, this is not, it was not 
income per se, it was revenue. The cost towards this revenue, which you know, it's, it's in the accounts, it's in, um, uh, these are audited accounts, they have been produced. You, know, um, you can uh, by all means go to the ROC and find them. And um, the, the scopes covered amongst us the project management part, as I said. We also did the provision of accommodation and um, all the necessary for the, uh, for the training of the RMN personnel, coordinated the involvement of Malaysian companies, assisted the main contract in complying with all local laws, coordinating monitoring RMN personnel in compliance with the main contract and also providing monthly reports um, they had per diem. Their families were there. Some children were actually produced, in, in, were born in, in, in France at that time in Brest. Uh, so that was to cover Perry Maker. The final profit that Perry Maker actually made at the end of the day was only close to like 105 million ringgit. So let me get this straight. 450 million ringgit? Yes. It went to provide accommodation? Uh, Project management? Integration services. How many uh, Royal Malaysian Navy personnel? Are we well, all in that time, there were, I think over the period, there were about 145. 145. Yes, including and with families. Including the dependents. Dependents, yes, that's right. That had to be housed, had to be accommodated, had to be looked after. This we had travel. Over a period of how many years? Oh, right through, really, from about four, four to five years. For almost four to five years. And what else, uh, what else so, uh, did you provide for the, for the Navy personnel? Oh, flights uh, to and fro to Malaysia, they, they, they were allowed to have certain flights back to their families. How many times a year? About, I think it was three, three times a year. Three, if I remember correctly. So, you know, all of that uh, was the cost, which for some reason seems to have been ignored in all this uh, speculation that uh, uh, I read. And uh, so ultimately, uh, 105 million, of which 40% uh, was going to Bausted and LTAT, who were shareholders, and then after tax. And then that amount went to the company. There's been uh, allegations that uh, Altantria was murdered because she knew too much about the deal and the kickbacks, the alleged kickbacks and the commission, uh, and that she wanted a, a cut of the deal. Uh, Especially her fees is for, for being the translator for the project. Um, you were there during all the negotiation processes in Paris and in Malaysia. Well, yes, in the in the critical phases. The, the critical phase was to, um, at the point of the negotiations prior to the submission to the Minister of Defence, and, um, sorry, uh, Minister of Defence, and then of course it goes to the, prime, um, the cabinet and the uh, Malaysian government to approve. The, the, um, in that period, if in the critical stage of all our negotiations with, with, with the French. As you probably may be aware, the French do all their defense business worldwide in English. Um, and we, at no time, did we need a translator. Neither did we need a translator to, in English or, for that matter, in French. Or was she ever there? Was she mm, I can categorically say now, um, without any ambiguity, that she was never, never there. There was no such person involved in our negotiations. The French authorities conducted their own investigations uh, as to whether she was present in, in France during that period. Uh, what yes. were the findings? I think they've, they've mentioned that themselves in, in the various documents from the French police that there was no such person in that period between um, those years. And these are not um, in my, in my words. I mean, you have to accept that um, the French police are very thorough in, in their investigations. So there was no, no such person um, involved with us. 
or for that matter, as they said, even in, in France. What was the first time you heard of uh, Altantuya? The first time I've heard, unfortunately, um, was in 2006 October when I opened the your newspaper and um, read that this person um, had uh, passed away. The French investigation is against DCNS. Um, it has to do with a report, yes, against DCNS for supposedly corruptly obtaining a contract to sell submarines to Malaysia. So it's both that and Pakistan and Taiwan. So there are three countries involved here. Um, the Malaysian part, of course, SWARM, if I'm correct, only in 2012, um, April or so, became a party to the, 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 the case. I'm unsure as to prior to that whether they had any locus standi. So um, it is to a certain extent a, a, a French investigation uh, of um, uh, DCNS and Thales. And hence, um, I believe their offices were raided. And um, there, there were lots. Uh, the, you will read a substantial amount of process verbal, as French say, um, of uh, all the various officers that had worked uh, with me over that period of time. So um, the um, it's your, as to your your question, but it's it's sort of combination of. What do you think this? Um, story that she was the translator, uh, she was involved in this deal came from. How do you, how do you explain that? I am of the opinion that that question would be best directed to Mr. Beginder. Um, because I am certainly not aware or oh, oh, am not, was not aware, and still totally unaware un of any such person being involved in the business side of what we were doing. So I'm really uh, unable to, to shed any light except for the fact that she was certainly not involved with me in any, any business dealings. Again, we were the main architects of the deal, and certainly not involved with Mr. Fowler. Frederick Fowler, who is the uh, the principal contact uh, for us in, in France. There was uh, Fowler, uh, Guy Cogjean, um, Fougeron, and certainly none of us knew of such an individual. So it may have been a, a personal uh, relationship uh, between him and, um, and this young lady. Uh, you're absolutely certain that she was never there during during any of the meetings. Absolutely, yeah, and and I so so is I, Frederick Fowler. Certain of it, and he was the as I said the principal contact. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank Pleasure you. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much for having me.